This webinar is being hosted by the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence, and it is intended for domestic violence victim advocates, especially those working in shelter, doulas, and other birth workers interested in learning more about trauma-informed care and survivor support. Recently, the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence released the Technical Assistance Guidance, Birth Doulas and Shelter Advocates, Creating Partnerships and Building Capacity. This guidance was authored by Fern Gilkerson, an advocate focused on the intersections of abuse and health care, and also by myself, an advocate to end, end violence against women and a certified birth doula. Our intent was to provide information for advocates working in shelter and for birth doulas on the impact of trauma in pregnancy and childbirth, and to outline how a partnership between these two communities may be of benefit to pregnant survivors of domestic violence. Um, a link to this guidance has been provided for you in the content that was sent out um, in the email that you received. We'll also be sure to include it on other resource materials that you'll see throughout this presentation and also in a follow-up email as well. On this webinar, our presenter will discuss the basics of domestic violence and birth doula services to ensure that we're all on the same page. And then, and then she'll move on to discuss the unique aspects of trauma-informed care for pregnant survivors of abuse and how both professional communities may come together to enhance services to women in need. So I want to share a bit of information with you that we recently just received. Um, so as you can see on the slide in front of you, during the previous six-month period, from October 2013 to March 2014, or earlier this year, the National Domestic Violence Hotline saw a 12% increase in calls from pregnant survivors of abuse. So you can see already just from that increase in calls that this is a very important topic that needs our, our attention and that needs to be addressed. You can see here um, the number of calls that have come in from pregnant survivors, again, from the National Domestic Violence Hotline over the past three years. So you can see that in 2011, 1,965 pregnant survivors called in seeking services and support. What this chart depicts is that of those 1,965, it shows you how many of those callers also experienced emotional abuse, physical abuse, and sexual abuse. So as our presenter will speak about momentarily, oftentimes abuse is co-occurring any time that a survivor comes in contact either with the local service provider, when they call the National Domestic Violence Hotline, or when they may be, re may be receiving health-related services. So this uh, graph really shows you that uh, emotional abuse is one of the harshest forms of abuse that uh, pregnant survivors experience, but that they also experience physical abuse, which has multiple impacts on their physical well-being, the well-being of their child, as well as their emotional health. And then also you can see that sexual abuse comes into play. And this next chart here, um, I apologize that it may be a little bit difficult to read, but it pretty much shows you the types of services being requested um, by pregnant survivors when they call in. So as you can see, the bulk of survivors here in this section are calling in uh, requesting assistance with domestic violence shelter services. So again, it's so highly important that we address this issue and that we really think about how we can intervene in the lives of pregnant women to enhance their safety. And that's basically what the focus of our session is going to be, at, be about today. Um, I wanted to share this one anecdote that we received from someone who called uh, the National Domestic Violence Hotline. So this survivor says, it seems like he gets angrier now that I'm pregnant. Yesterday he started hitting me in the stomach and all I could do was curl up on the floor and try and protect the baby. I feel so vulnerable and alone. So this is what these women are facing, and this is why it's so very important that we really begin um, to increase our services and our support to this community and that we continue to work together to expand the services that we're able to provide. So before we get started and really delve in, um, I want to find out a little bit more about who's on this webinar. So if you can take a moment and look to the left, um, and you should see a feedback feature that uh, will allow you to respond. So if you can let us know which role best describes your work in this field. 
So A would be domestic or sexual violence victim advocate. B would be birth or postpartum doula or childbirth educator. C, midwife or healthcare professional. D is a state or national TA provider. And then E is other, and you can certainly provide us with additional information in the public chat. So I'm going to share that information with you. So hopefully you all can see the pie chart that depicts the numbers of who's on the call with us today. So I'm just taking a moment for everyone to finish responding. Great, thank you so much. So I'm going to clear that out. We have another question. Um, our next question, and this is going to be a yes or no. Have you ever worked with a pregnant woman that experienced ab abuse, either past or present? And while you all are responding, I can say um, that I've certainly, in my experience working in shelter, have seen pregnant women come into shelter. Um, oftentimes I would see women coming into shelter with newborns um, who had women who had recently given birth and then they were assaulted by their partner and it's really only been a few weeks following the birth and now she's seeking support services. Um, so it's really unfortunate and, you know, sometimes the most devastating thing to see, you know, women who barely had an opportunity themselves to heal from the experience who are also then experiencing some form of assault and seeking safe shelter with their children. So it looks like um, a large majority of folks on the webinar have worked with pregnant women who've experienced abuse, okay? So we have one more question. Let me clear this out. Our third question, did you feel confident in providing trauma-informed care that was specific to our history and experience of abuse? Um, and if anyone would like to share in the public chat, um, you can feel free to do so very briefly. Again, keeping the woman's identity private. And don't feel like you have to respond in the public chat with anyone's story, but I know sometimes on webinars like this, it's really great to learn from each other and to really have that sharing community. So it looks like um, even though a large number of folks on the webinar have worked with pregnant women who've experienced abuse, not a lot of us have felt really confident in our ability to provide trauma-informed care. Okay. Well, thank you so much for uh, participating in that. And um, I see that someone posted that past sexual abuse that she'd experienced as a child boiled up during her first birth. I think that's something that um, is fairly common and that we're going to talk a little bit more about in terms of what trauma looks like when pregnant women are laboring and giving birth. So thank you for sharing that. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about our presenter and then I'm going to pass it over to Pam. So our presenter, uh, Pam Glenn, is a graduate of George, Georgetown University. She's been a certified nurse midwife for nearly 30 years. She's worked in a variety of settings providing both full-scope midwife services as well as focused reproductive care. Pam has been the director of Advanced Practice Nurses for Planned Parenthood of Minnesota, North Dakota, and South Dakota, supervising 40 to 50 clinicians for the past eight years. More recently, she has chosen to return full-time to clinical care while also working as an accreditation surveyor consultant for Planned Parenthood Federation of America. Throughout her career, Pam has focused on screening for domestic violence and abuse. Her work has included providing clinical services at battered women's shelter. For over 10 years, Pam has taught screening for domestic violence and abuse in healthcare settings to RN and APN students as well as other healthcare clinicians. Thank you so much, Pam, for being here today, and I'm now going to pass it over to you. Okay, give me one second to get Pam on the line.
Okay, hold on one second. I think maybe we accidentally uh, disconnected with Pam. Hold on one second. Kenya, can you hear me? Ah, oh, yes, there you are. I can hear you now. Oh, yes, I redialed in. I apologize. Thank you so much for your patience. No problem. Thank you. Okay, I will go ahead and get rolling. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, and Kenya, I just wanted to ask, oh, there we go. I just wanted to make sure these, uh, these slides were forwarding. Um, so to begin, it's an honor to be a part of this unique project. I commend the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence for pulling together these important groups, the doulas um, and the domestic violence advocates. And as I prepared for this presentation, I had just an, an obvious but yet an aha moment um, because the screening for domestic violence and abuse has been an integral part of my midwife practice again, nearly 30 years, and it just feels so fitting to be part of this project, but I am also very honored to be a part of this. Um, and most importantly, I do always like to acknowledge that my patients, although I've had much training over the years and I've done talks on screening for domestic violence abuse for healthcare professionals, um, my patients have taught me much about the realities of abuse in their lives, and I always want to acknowledge that. So today's presentation, I'm going to give a very brief background about this project and then focus on three areas. First, I want to review the basics of domestic violence and abuse. I think it's important to acknowledge that we have many participants on this call who have a wide range of experience with this issue, um, and I do also understand that it will be a review for some. Secondly, I want to look at birth planning and focusing on the women who are presently in the shelter system. And then thirdly, focusing on women still living in abuse in, uh, with abuse in their homes and their relationships. And I think in particular of, of the doulas who are working with a pregnant woman and probably her partner as well and possibly picking up cues. So we will be talking about all that in detail. I do have many slides, and the purpose of that is to make sure that you have this information at your fingertips to refer to in the future. So some I'm going to be running through very quickly, and others I will absolutely be spending more time on. And any time I give a presentation on this topic, I also want to acknowledge that this information may hit home for participants who may be new to this topic and who also may be dealing with their own personal situation of abuse. And if that is the case, I encourage you to reach out um, after the call. So to begin, we have two major goals of this uh, presentation today and this project, to provide information for both uh, victim advocates and doulas regarding the impact and identification of abuse in pregnant women. And again, we're going to be looking at the two groups, pregnant women who are in, living in the shelters as well as pregnant women who are experiencing abuse in their homes and relationships and not in a shelter system at this point. Secondly, I think it's going to be extremely empowering that we can begin discussion and have a framework for partnership between the doulas and advocates. And again, I think it will lead to future conversations and a very um, strong partnership that can happen and ultimately to better care for the pregnant women who are in these situations. And why these two communities? Well, both care deeply about women and issues that impact their health and well-being. Both seek to improve health out outcomes for women. Both serve in this empowerment base in an advocate role, and both engage women on this time-limited basis. But I, would, um, I do believe firmly that this engagement can impact women in such a positive, constructive way for the rest of their lives. And I do want to say that, you know, for the advocates, you may have never thought you'd be dealing with pregnancy issues or m maybe when you first uh, decided to um, learn this role. And for doulas, you may have never thought you'd be dealing with abuse issues. But I think that um, after this presentation, that will become very clear how these issues um, and these, these roles overlap in such an important way. 
Um, each state and county has um, domestic violence shelters and services, and they are supported by national organizations. So let's look at the um, domestic violence and abuse victim advocate role. And oftentimes women um, connect uh, with the shelter by calling the National Domestic Violence Hotline. And I so appreciate, Kenya, the extra information you provided of how often pregnant women are calling this hotline. That was fabulous information to have. I also like to point out that when women call this hotline number, um, they are on that same call connected to a local advocate um, who is in their area, and that's uh, appropriate for or fits um, uh, calls that occur from all over the country. So after completing a short intake, survivors can expect to receive shelter, meals, as well as, well as other um, uh, products that they may need, clothing, counseling, and case management services to help them plan for the future. Uh, shelter advocates have a broad range of responsibilities, and looking at the, this list, you can see that they are constantly multitasking to the nth degree from responding to crisis line calls, assisting families with transportation, child care, running of the house, planning family-oriented activities, managing disputes, and in the midst of that all, maintaining a positive, welcoming atmosphere. And again, I, I applaud uh, the advocates on this call because it truly is a multitasking role. And doulas are, um, in modern terms, uh, they guide the mother through pregnancy, labor, delivery, and postpartum, and they receive training from a certifying organization. So most doulas will provide free initial consultation and in-person birth planning that starts prenatally. They're on call prior to the birth, and they provide continuous labor support through delivery and including the postpartum period. And this may also include postpartum follow-up visits. So when you think about, for example, a woman in a shelter who's going back to the shelter potentially, uh, the doula can help with those postpartum visits at the shelter as well. Um, doulas also help and support with breastfeeding and they can make referrals to other community resources. So again, I think the more that we network with the resources in our communities, the more um, uh, quality work and, and assistance we can provide. Any expectant woman can benefit from the assistance of a doula no matter what type of um, birth she may be planning. So doulas, again, and more specifically, provide support through comprehensive birth planning, education, emotional support. They help with comfort measures, and specifically comfort measures and, and uh, position changes during labor and birth, and they um, proactively help with birth coaching and advocacy as well as during the birth process. So I do want to make a note that doulas are not medical professionals. They don't make medical decisions, and they do not help women actually deliver their babies. Midwives and physicians perform that function. Okay, and just want to, uh, for anybody who may be joining late, we're on slide number 12. So doula support has been proven to make a difference by having um, more likely to have a spontaneous vaginal birth but also decreasing the use of medications during labor, use of Pitocin for inductions um, or um, to speed up the contractions, um, a, decrease, a significant decrease in the, the uh, use of cesarean section, and an improvement in satisfaction in the birth ex with the birth experience. Okay. So let's get started with the uh, rest of the presentation. And I love this slide um, because, well, and I'll digress for a moment. I'm calling from Minnesota where I live. And it, as many of you probably know, it's the land of 10,000 lakes. And I am happy to announce that our lakes are now, uh, the ice is gone and we have actual water out there again after this long winter. Um, but I love this slide because we all know what happens when you drop a rock into water. It has rippling effects. And I love this visual because we all need to keep in mind that when an incident of abuse happens, oops, let's get that, there we go. When an incident of, of abuse happens or maybe multiple incidents, it not only affects the, the person on the receiving end, 
but also their loved ones, their family, and all of our communities. And I love this slide as well because what I hope to say is we all have experienced some aspect of domestic violence and abuse, whether it's through the work we do. For some, it may be a more direct experience than others, and we all learn from each other. I do hope that after this conversation today that you see this issue or some aspects of this issue with new eyes. It's vital that all of us who work in this field set realistic definitions of success for ourselves. And I often point out that simply by addressing this issue, uh, we have done our jobs. I often think about my drives home and how I may think through, gosh, I had that patient today who I talked through about you know, her abusive situation. Did I say it the right way? Did I ask the right questions? But I can know and be proud of my work if I know that I have addressed that issue. I think it's vital we all set realistic definitions of success so that we don't burn ourselves out or have unrealistic expectations. Um, and we need to understand that one conversation with someone in this situation is not necessarily um, going to lead to immediate action, and more often than not, it does not. So we need to understand that it's a process. So looking at our roles, I, I like to keep things simple and think through listening and observing, validate the experience, and then re have a referral for that um, client that we're concerned about. And I do want to point out that just like the victim advocates, doulas are not expected to intervene, but the purpose of this presentation today is so that we can all be well, better connected and, for example, doulas can provide warm referrals to the advocates uh, when they have uh, somebody that they are concerned about who is in an abusive situation. So in all my talks, I like to address the idea of stereotypes. And we're all human. We all hold stereotypes in our brains about various people and topics. Um, I like to do an exercise, whether I'm talking to high school students or nurse practitioner students, to kind of get at these stereotypes that we may be holding in our brains. And the problem with stereotypes is that it's like having the blinders on and it prevents us from seeing um, that these situations may be happening right in front of us um, to somebody that we may least likely expect. What I often do is ask three questions. And I always say you do not have to be politically correct when you answer these questions. Be brutally honest. And one of the questions is, what do you first think of when I say the word abuse? More often than not, in the lay public, people think solely of physical violence. And that's um, limiting because someone may be in a very emotionally abusive relationship, as many of you know. That is abuse, even if no physical violence is going on, and it has devastating effects and impacts on people's lives. The next question I ask is, who do you picture when I say an abuser? And I particularly appreciate the honesty of my ninth grade uh, health class students who often picture a macho male, maybe he's really hairy, that came up in one of my talks one time, somebody who's got an alcohol problem, he's a drinker, lives in a trailer park. We get this skewed view of who an abuser is. And again, it keeps us from understanding and realizing who else is out there. Um, and again, then the third question I often ask is, who do you picture when I say someone who gets abused? That picture um, often comes up as a picture of a very weak, um, frail, scared woman, maybe hovering in a corner or hiding in a corner. Oftentimes, and I had this lesson taught to me by a patient long ago, oftentimes it's a woman who is maybe very successful. You describe her as confident. Um, she is dressed to a T, very successful in her work. But we, can't, we must acknowledge that that woman also may be experiencing an abusive relationship. And I also want to add it happens to men as well. So who gets abused, who abuses? We could say all categories. And it is all ages, including the elderly, all cultural and religious backgrounds, poor, middle class, rich, it doesn't matter. Um, it may play out a little differently based on their socioeconomic levels, but it, it impacts all lines and crosses all lines. All types of relationships, including lesbian and gay relationships, people with disabilities from rural to metropolitan areas, and males and females. 
This definition of abuse from the University of Michigan highlights two important concepts that are playing a role in um, abuse behavior. Abuse is intentional. We often wonder if it's just somebody getting ticked off and losing their temper, but it's not. It's an intentional use of abusive tactics to get and maintain power and control over an intimate partner. We could talk all day about what leads people to, to be abusive, and many, many studies have been done looking at that question. My answer at this point is I think the answer is multifactorial and very complex. But if we all just continue to remember that people who are abusive have a very strong need to have power and control over another person, it will help us to understand why we're seeing the behaviors that we're seeing. So in essence, the abusers act not because they're out of control, they act out of a need to control. We often also misinterpret this as uh, an abuser needing anger management assistance. But we need to remember that this isn't an anger issue, rather violence comes from the need to have power and control. Um, there are many different categories of abuse and this percentage varies from study to study. Usually physical abuse um, is more often male towards their female partners, but again it can happen in all different relationships and be female towards their male partners as well. Emotional abuse, which can go both ways. Sexual abuse, forcing someone to do something sexually they do not want to do. Spiritual abuse, using religion to assert superiority over another person. And financial abuse, um, having control of the money. I often, in, during my work at the, the shelter a few years back, it was awful, often um, just disconcerting to me that I would see a, a woman at the shelter who just was growing in incredible ways. And it was off, often just very um, sad to see that when she was ready to find her own housing, um, that because of the financial impact and, and play that happened with her previously abusive relationship, maybe she had poor credit rating as a result, it was difficult for her um, to get housing. So the next few slides are looking at statistics, and these are the slides I'm going to run through quickly, but I really hope that you all refer back to them to understand how prevalent this issue is in our culture. So emotional abuse, according to this study, goes, goes halfway, half men, half, or nearly half of all women and men have experienced some type of psychological aggression by a partner in their lifetime. Physical abuse, again, is more commonly male towards their female partners. It's estimated that one out of every three women experiences at least one physical assault by a partner during adulthood, and one in four women reported lifetime forced sex, and of this group, more than one third were 15 years old or younger at the time of this experience. So it's so vital we understand how often our young uh, people are dealing with this issue, again, at very early ages. Sexual violence, again, nearly one in 10 women has been raped by an intimate partner in her lifetime. So let's focus on the scope of this issue during pregnancy. Abuse often begins and escalates during pregnancy for a variety of reasons. Physical violence was found to occur 7 to 20% of all pregnancies. Um, women with unintended pregnancies are at a greater risk of intimate partner violence th than those with planned pregnancies, and in one study, a three times greater no amount of risk. Um, and in this country, in general, over half of the pregnancies are unintended, so that puts this into greater perspective. Um, abused pregnant women are three times more likely to be victims of attempted or completed homicide. And very sobering slide here, homicide perpetrated by a current or former partner is the leading cause of maternal mortality. Again, these statistics are very sobering when you think of all the multitude of physical pregnancy complications that can happen, um, but homicide is a leading cause of maternal mortality. Okay, and I am now on slide number 26. And just continuing on, the term femicide has been um, described women 
who are murdered um, by their partners. 94% of female murder victims are killed by a man they knew. Um, about 70% of murdered women are killed by a partner or ex. And separated and divorced women are most at risk, but especially during those first few months after leaving. And this is where I will continue to insert all the more reason that women who are leaving an abusive partner work with an advocate to develop a very sound uh, safety plan to make sure they're leaving in a safe way. This can be a very dangerous time. But I so appreciate what Jackie Campbell, who has done so much work in this area, has said. There remains a greater risk for women who choose to stay. So I do want to take um, a moment and, and take the next few slides. And this may sound rather basic. Um, I want to talk through the various dynamics and behaviors that are emotional abuse. These can also serve as warning signs. So for example, if I have a patient who's out there in the dating world, I'll review a few of these behaviors with them so they understand that if they see them starting to creep into this new relationship that may happen in the future, they know that this is probably not going to be a healthy relationship. So I want to begin with isolation. It's often one of the first behaviors that is seen as these relationships develop. And this is where the abuse is a variety of tactics, and they isolate their partner from family, friends, maybe from activities they love to do. Um, and I had one patient um, who so poignantly explained how this played out in her previously abusive relationship. She said, Pam, you know what, every time I wanted to have time with my girlfriends or family, he would say, I love you so much, I want to be with you all the time. And certainly we want to be with the person we love. It's very flattering to, want to, to know that your partner wants to be spending time with you. But when it's taken to the extreme that the partner is not allowed to keep up their other important relationships in their lives, it can be very devastating. And once the abuser isolates their partner, they have more power and control over them. Saying I love you too soon, rushing the relationship is another tactic of having more power and control over a partner. Um, the abuser may define their partner and define their identity, maybe even telling them what opinions to have and even as concrete as telling them what style of clothes they need to wear. Degrading is another dynamic of abuse where the abuser may call their partner um, degrading names like bitch, whore, slut, bastard. The abuser may humiliate their partner in public. Again, this is very humiliating. Or the very opposite dynamic may happen. The abuser may uh, um, degrade their partner in private when no one is around to witness it. So the example I often use is let's say I'm with this guy Joe and everyone thinks he's wonderful, he's charmed me, he's charmed my family and friends. But behind closed doors when no one's around to witness it, he starts calling me bitch, whore, or slut. Um, he starts putting me down, maybe physical violence starts happening and, uh, um, and nobody is around to witness it. So when I finally do talk with somebody and explain that this is happening, the question often comes up, how likely am I to be believed? Because this dynamic can often play out in this way and be very confusing. Possessiveness has reached a whole new high-tech level, and I do acknowledge we have a lot of texting going on out there, but this is taking it to the nth degree where the abuser is constantly checking on their partner when they're not together, and it's an interrogation type of checking up, um, asking where they're at, what they're doing, who they're talking to. The abuser may become jealous when there's really no basis for it. The abuser may accuse their partner of cheating, or flirting um, with someone when the partner has done no such thing. And often this can play out in very simple ways. For example, the partner may no longer want to have conversations with the person at the coffee house or checking out at the grocery store because they're afraid their abuser is going to accuse them of flirting. Again, this is another tactic to further isolate them from those in their lives. Fear and intimidation. This is where the abuser may just have a look or tone of voice that they use in an, intim in an intimidating way to get what they want. And I do want to point out up until now, all of these dynamics are emotional abuse and have devastating effects. But this is the dynamic where physical threats may start to come into play. 
This is also the dynamic where a weapon may be, be used by the abuser in a threatening way. As a midwife, if I hear that a weapon is being used this way in a relationship as a threat, I need to inform my patient that her risk of getting murdered has now just gone sky high. And the patient may have no idea that she's even in danger. So it's important to talk through and name these behaviors and identify the risk. Sexual coercion, as I mentioned before, the abuser forces their partner to do something sexually they don't want to do. They may introduce alcohol or drugs into the relationship to have the partner uh, more vulnerable to unwanted sexual activity. And the abuser may actually use calculated actions to lead to pregnancy. And this is called birth control sabotage. The abuser interferes with a partner's contraception. They may hide or withhold pills. They may put a hole in the condom, all for the purpose of leading to a pregnancy. And I do want to point out this goes both ways. Sometimes abusers want to have actions lead to a pregnancy for the intention of having more power and control over their partner. Sometimes it's the opposite. Let's say the uh, partner becomes pregnant and the abuser may take actions that lead to escalating abuse, maybe even forcing them to have an abortion that they don't really want to have. So it can play out in all sorts of different ways. But back to birth control sabotage. The abuser may pull out vaginal rings, tear off contraceptive patches. And I recently had the example of a patient whose partner wanted a pregnancy she did not, and he actually removed the IUD during sex while she was unaware. Crazy making is another dynamic of abuse, and it is just as it sounds. The abuser um, calls and accuses their partner of being the crazy one causing all the problems. Uh, this can play out in a variety of ways, from the abuser denying or minimizing or blaming the partner for the abusive incident. And this is a constant twisting of the truth that happens by the abuser and makes it a very uh, confusing situation for the partner. Last but not least is ma manipulation desperation. The abuser, it may, it may play out as this. The abuser may say to their partner, um, you're the only one in the whole world who understands me. And that's often followed by, um, that's often followed by, um, I'll kill myself if you leave me. Um, I've been shocked over the years working with high school students how often they see this dynamic play out in couples around them. And we need to be making sure we're getting help for both um, both uh, the abuser and the partner in this situation. So having talked through these definitions of emotional abuse, um, I do want to share a quick story. There was one night at the battered women's shelter where I was asked um, to, to just simply provide a, a health class for the um, women who were at the shelter that evening. There were about eight women sitting around the table. And one night, I simply just went through these dynamics as I have with all of you. And it was an amazing experience because as I talked, their eyes got big, their jaws dropped down, and they appeared just completely empowered that all the different things that they had been living with with their abusive partner were simply being defined for them. I think it's important that we define these behaviors for our patients, and I think it can be very empowering for them and help them to um, move through the process of understanding this better and taking action. So this, is an, uh, uh, this has been around for a long time, this cycle of abuse that happens more often with physically violent relationships. Women in these relationships often get very good at understanding and seeing the tension build in their abusive partner that's followed by the battering incident and then followed by a honeymoon or remorse phase, as we call it, where the abuser will apologize and say, I love you and I promise this will never happen again. But as I point out to my patients in these relationships, um, if they choose to stay, the cycle will get more frequent and um, the abuse will be more than likely become more severe. Many people ask, why do people stay in abusive situations? And the answers and responses of why they stay in these situations are just a, a huge long list from commitment to the relationship, hope that it will get better, maybe financial dependence, um, again, staying for the kids, a variety of reasons that people stay. 
there are various stages that people take to leave a situation and stages of leaving. When I'm listening to one of my patients, as I hope you're listening to your clients, one of the things I'm trying to assess is where are they at in these stages? Are they in pre-contemplation where they're not concerned about the situation and maybe in total denial of the danger they're in? Contemplation is where the patient's considered some change, but they're not yet ready to take action. Then they're determined to take action and then taking actual action. Again, I can't emphasize enough how important it is that a safety plan be put into place before they take action to make sure they're safe during this dangerous time. I do always ask the question, and this question is being asked more often by professionals around the country, what about those who choose to stay with their abuser? And more effort and energy is put into helping those who choose to stay when both the partner and the abuser want to make positive change. And I think there will be more coming in the future uh, looking at that situation. Okay, we are now on slide 41. And um, I uh, just want to continue on by looking at the health effects of abuse. Physical health effects affect every body sy system. They can range from arthritis to headaches, many chronic issues, including chronic pelvic pain that I often see in my midwife practice. And often many tests are done and there's no clear etiology of why this is happening. Also irritable bowel syndrome, variety of physical health effects occur in, in these folks. Mental health effects include clinical depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress, which can lead to sleep and eating disturbances, even eating disorders. And if you just look at sleep disturbances alone, that can lead to a multitude of health effects. People who are in these situations often live in constant fear, which leads to incredible fatigue, some startle reactions. And although it's unhealthy, many people in these situations end up turning to substance abuse as a way to try to cope, whether it may be alcohol or drugs. And we often see high-risk behaviors, multitude of, um, of unsafe sex and lack of contraception. Pregnancy complications can range from low weight gain to bleeding and hemorrhage, placental issues, possibly from getting punched in the abdomen, fetal injuries as well, depression and suicide attempts, um, substance abuse again. I think it's vital that we be very careful not to judge pregnant women who are using substances as a way to cope. I always try to tell myself and the people who I'm training that we need to stand back when we see these situations, hold judgment, and make sure we're looking at the underlying issue um, that's leading to this abuse. And I do want to point out that teens are at higher risk of abuse during pregnancy as well. Okay, so let's move into abuse inquiries and warm referrals, looking at birth planning. So birth planning, uh, birth planning begins with the first visit and evolves throughout the pregnancy. And I think um, initially about doulas who are beginning to establish relationships with their new clients. But we also, again, have advocates with pregnant women in the shelters who um, will be involved in birth planning. But again, if there's a partnership, I think it will help the advocate role to be able to call on a doula who can take over this role and help with all these, um, with, with this service. I do want us to step back though before we get into the nitty gritty of birth planning and look at the effects of sexual abuse on pregnancy and birth and also abuse in general. And I really appreciate this quote from Our Bodies Ourselves because abuse issues are sometimes triggered unexpectedly during pregnancy and birth. It may be conscious memories or flashbacks to the abuse or possibly unconscious body memories. I was taught long ago, um, especially with women who had a history of sexual abuse, the body has a memory and even though they may be unaware, um, it can lead to body memories and play out as tension anger, sick feelings, or other discomforts when a woman is reminded of abuse. Common triggers include early in the pregnancy as the uterus is growing. Fetal movement may trigger memories of abuse. Vaginal exams. 
Uh, when I'm doing a vaginal exam on a patient who I'm aware has a history of abuse, I make sure to talk through every step of the vaginal exam, let them know ahead of time what will be happening, and I always say to those patients, hey, you're in charge, and if you need me to stop at any point, you let me know. Um, think about all the invasive procedures that can happen in pregnancy and in labor and birth. Um, it can absolutely be a trigger uh, to history of abuse. And just the general discomfort that can happen during pregnancy as well as pain that can happen during labor and birth and postpartum focused on the areas of the vagina, abdomen, back, breasts, and perineum. And so these triggers are very, very common and something we need to all be aware of. Looking at the prenatal care provider, and again, from our bodies ourselves, they talk about our interaction with care providers who are often looked at as authority figures who may expect compliance and trust. And this can remind the woman of the perpetrator with whom they felt helpless, unequal, submissive, or overpowered. And I do want to point out the medical care provider may be doing nothing threatening. It may be how they're being perceived. Um, but again, the medical providers can best do their jobs when they fully understand that their patient has a history of abuse and they can better then meet their needs. So I think it's vital to include the prenatal care provider in the birth plan, in the development of this plan, as well as the birth staff at the hospital. And this allows everyone to be on the same page and be as supportive as possible to this pregnant woman. So specifically, specifically looking at giving birth and when, when somebody has a history of, of abuse. And again, the delivery may trigger deep memories um, associated with the trauma. It might be through experiences, through feelings and sensations, smells, objects, or people or places at the birth. And think about labor. We don't have control over the contractions that occur, how often they're going to occur, what type of labor we're going to have. But that is accentuated, I think, for women who have a history of abuse. They may have feelings of being violated during vaginal exams or even as the baby is um, moving through the birth canal and during the birth process. Um, women may feel tied down or restrained, um, even by a blood pressure cuff, by IVs, if they're indicated, fetal monitors, et cetera. Women, pregnant women may have adverse reactions to the presence of medical authorities. They may also feel that loss of modesty and dignity in their presence, and more to the nth degree. Those feelings of being exposed or vulnerable, especially thinking about some of the positions that women do need to take during labor and birth to help labor progress and help birth to occur, and that can trigger some feelings of being vulnerable. So how can doulas help? Um, it's important from day one that time is taken to develop that trust and rapport. I can't emphasize enough that our approach needs to be non-judgmental and compassionate. We need to provide that safe environment for these women to communicate their needs and talk through their concerns. Using a gentle, non-critical tone of voice is vital as well. And we need to continually understand how often the impact of shame plays a role for these women and how they're feeling about themselves. Um, during the, um, the birth planning, I think it's important to explore the women's past experiences with healthcare. Was it positive? Um, was it threatening? And was it threatening because of something the healthcare provider did or was that more um, in anticipation by, uh, by the woman? Identify what plans the woman has already, been put, has already put into place, and I think that needs to be respected and praise given. But more, most importantly, during the birth planning, we need to empower this pregnant woman to be the decision maker during this process. We need to take care not to overwhelm her uh, with too many choices at one time, but we also need to be careful that we don't take over this decision making process for her. That's what she's used to from her perpetrator. We need to begin to keep helping her to grow and feel empowered to be, again, the decision maker for this labor and birth. Um, I think it's helpful to coach the woman on ways to ask for clarity and, and ways to express herself with medical professionals and staff. It's important we treat her with dignity and respect and prompt others to do the same. 
We want to, assuming there's no contraindications, work to make sure her wishes are honored. Now, during labor, it's vital that we watch for cues that she may be experiencing the triggers that we've already talked about. There may be flashbacks, maybe disassociation that occurs. We need to acknowledge her concerns, talk about this prenatally, and have her prepared that this is a possibility during labor and birth. Practice grounding techniques. Reassure her that she's safe and use positive af affirmations for empowerment. Another story that I will share that happened um, quite a few years ago, I was in the midst of a delivery and the patient had never disclosed during her pregnancy and I don't believe she ever disclosed to her husband, uh, which we found out after the fact that she did have a history of sexual abuse in childhood. And when we were in the process of having her pushed, the baby was just about ready to be born, the head was soon to be crowning. Um, she had the flashback, she disassociated, she was really mentally no longer with us. She was calling out for her mom in a very childlike voice. And yes, it felt very uncomfortable to me because I know that she kind of looked at me with sort of glassed over eyes and saw me as a perpetrator. And when I realized what was happening, we all just kept trying to reassure her, tell her she was safe, and it took her time to come out of that place. Um, that's a pretty dramatic story, but to, to explain and um, share that this certainly can happen. Okay, so prenatally, um, as you're establishing a birth plan early on with this pregnant woman, it's important to identify a midwife or physician that best will be tuned in to this patient. And again, it's, it's so vital that the healthcare provider, the prenatal care provider um, be um, involved in this birth plan as well. I think it's also vital that we do all we can to encourage this pregnant woman to disclose to their provider their history of abuse and the potential effects that they may anticipate. We want to offer birth settings which best meet the patient's need, also looking at location and privacy. Um, considering who might be at the birth and what privacy needs to be put into place. This is where doulas can offer continuous labor support, and I know doulas, you're very good at defining your role for the patients, um, but for these patients in particular, it's important to make sure they're clear on your role. Um, you may end up accompanying her to prenatal visit if she has no one else to accompany her, maybe even to birth classes which need to be arranged for her as well. Um, and pregnancy complications can arise. So making sure that ahead of time, the doulas and, and advocates are having a plan B and having arrangements in case a pregnancy complication occurs earlier in the pregnancy. Part of the birth plan focusing on intrapartum needs to include looking at transportation. How are they gonna to get to the hospital, possibly from the shelter system? Who's gonna be present for support? And are there concerns about who may be at the birth, including the abuser who may have a restraining order against him? The doulas will be working with, with the patients, um, planning comfort measures and discussing pain relief options. There are many non-pharmaceutical pain relief options, such as walking, having the woman in the shower tub, and massage. With massage, I would have the doula be very careful and ask the mom what types of touch are they comfortable with because there may be types of touch or a location of touch that is also a trigger. Um, there are also pharmaceutical options, of course, uh, for pain relief during labor, and these need to be really clearly defined and, and the pros and cons understood for this pregnant woman. Positioning during labor and birth. We often picture women in bed during labor, but I always try to encourage people and women who are going to be laboring to be in a variety of positions from walking, sitting on a chair in the shower, being in the tub, sitting in a rocking chair, or leaning forward over a bed and rocking their hips. Um, women also need to be talked uh, and in, uh, instructed on electronic fetal monitoring, what that looks like, and can they have intermittent monitoring if there are no complications. Other medical interventions that, that might be indicated include an IV, induction of her episiotomy or cesarean section. All this, again, needs to be discussed, especially with a woman who has a history of abuse, so they understand ahead of time um, 
what these situations are and also understanding the triggers that can result. Birth planning in pregnancy needs to also look at postpartum. Sometimes women who have had a history of abuse may be very uncomfortable with the idea of breastfeeding and we need to be supportive of that decision. But if they do choose to breastfeed, it's vital that they access their lactation consultants if they're in a hospital setting. And these consultants can be available to the women after they um, leave the hospital and are maybe back in the shelter system. Plans need to be made for immediate newborn care. Where is the postpartum care going to occur? What is the rest time like? And for both doulas and advocates, I think it's very um, helpful to have a public health nurse uh, come out and visit this patient, whether they're in their homes or in the shelter system. Birth control needs to be addressed, and there are a few hidden methods um, that we often recommend, such as DEPO, the uh, birth control injection, which is given every three months and is certainly a very hidden uh, method. And with IUCs or IUDs, same thing. Um, we often um, leave a, a bit of the string um, attached to the IUD, but in situations of abuse, we may shorten that string so the abuser um, doesn't know that the IUD is in place. Postpartum also needs to be discussed with a mom who may already be experiencing depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress, because as a result, they are also at risk for postpartum depression and even psychosis. Again, keeping um, abreast of these symptoms, uh, having that connection with the, the prenatal provider is vital. And also making sure we're watching the bonding uh, that happens between that mom and her newborn. Um, and, you know, a question comes to my mind, what if this pregnancy resulted from a situation of forced sex. We want to make sure this bonding is still happening and watch the touch and approach that the mom is taking with her newborn baby. Okay, moving on then to our third area, women living with abuse. And I think of the doulas who, again, are meeting new clients and maybe starting to pick up on, on cues that abuse is happening in their lives and how important this connection with an advocate is. And again, I'm so grateful that this project is happening to help this connection get stronger. So red flags um, for doulas who are meeting with their pregnant women. The pregnant woman may have frequently rescheduled or missed appointments that often get canceled at the last minute. They may have not even started prenatal care or they're waiting late in their pregnancy to do so. Now, every woman I know who's been pregnant has concerns and a certain level of worry over their unborn child, and that's normal, it's healthy, it's our protective mechanisms kicking in. But women who are in abusive situations often exhibit a very extreme worry about their baby's health. Um, they may share with you about abnormal bleeding, inadequate nutrition. And I do want to go back to this extreme worry about her baby's health, and it may be because she's been getting punched in the abdomen by her abuser um, and physically assaulted as well. This woman may disclose a history of repeated abortions, STIs, a history of trauma, including depression, anxiety, things we've already talked about. Um, so if this woman discloses this history, again, these are also red flags. Uh, the pregnant woman may have some untreated injuries from bite marks, head injuries, bruises, scars, which are often inconsistent with her story or her explanation of why they've occurred. There may be bruises in various stages of healing, but usually these injuries are often hidden. They're usually proximal on the body rather than distal, and that is a calculated um, uh, attempt by the abuser to keep this hidden. The woman may minimize her injuries and being hurt. I often see women in these situations coming into the clinics having multiple vague complaints from anywhere from headaches to pelvic pain, backaches, and oftentimes, although much testing is done, no cause is identified. The woman may also talk to you about being socially isolated, and we need to acknowledge that we are a very mobile society, um, but when they're extremely socially isolated, that is a red flag. Red flags that you may see with the partner who's abusive. 
Um, he may hover, but never even fully participate in these visits, but he's hovering. Yet he may exhibit over concern for the mother and begin answering all the questions for her. Um, oftentimes I am guessing out of fear of her saying the wrong thing or disclosing that she's in an abusive situation. If you do begin to ask questions about abuse, again, it needs to be done in private, non-judgmental, compassionate communication in a safe environment with that gentle tone of voice and understanding the impact of shame. It's important to normalize the inquiry. So for example, um, saying for those of you who maybe are not used to asking these questions or maybe not comfortable yet asking these questions, this can be helpful saying to a client, hey, I asked a few questions about this important health topic of all my clients and I have a few questions to ask you. When I ask the question, and I recommend that we initially avoid wording, using the word abuse. Again, back to the stereotypes that people hold, they hear the word abuse and they automatically think physical violence. Rather, I, I encourage that we ask about emotional abuse dynamics that may be happening. So for example, I may say to a patient, and I do routinely say, hey, does your partner let you still continue important relationships with your family and friends? Do they let you hang out with family and friends? Or are they constantly checking up on you when you're not together? Are they putting you down, calling you names? And then I'll ask about physical abuse and forced sexual abuse. It's important that we focus on the cues, including potential emotional abuse. And we need to define emotional abuse as we went through those earlier slides. Um, we need to name the behavior for what it is, and this, again, can be very empowering. If somebody discloses, and I'll be talking about your response in a minute if they disclose, it's important to link that violence and abuse can have an impact on their health, and I think that's an important part of their healing and understanding of the situation they're in. If you have observations, state them very respectfully. Um, for example, I've said to patients in the past, you know, you seem really hesitant to answer my routine questions about this, and I'm concerned. Let's talk about it a little further if you feel comfortable. Um, I think it's also vital that, again, we inform clients of their risks, develop that safety plan, and provide resources. So let's think through your responses, because oftentimes people say to me, I am comfortable asking some of these questions, but what do I do if a patient discloses they're in these situations? No matter what the patient's or the client's response, it's important we keep the door open to future conversations. So let's take the patient who denies abuse despite evidence. It's important that we're respectful, we provide resources, we avoid blaming and shaming, and um, provide uh, and do some follow-up in the future. So um, I'm going to share another story about this. I had a patient who was middle-aged, came in probably five, six years in a row for her physical exams, never had any uh, disclosure or signs of abuse when I'd ask my routine questions. But one year she came in, and when I went to do the exam, and again she had denied a history of abuse, but when I did the exam, she had four oval bruises on her forearm. And long story short, when I asked about it, she gave me very clear language and body language, verbal and body language, that she did not want to talk to me about this issue. I wanted to be respectful of her, her message to me. And so what I did instead of saying, you know, I'm concerned about you, I said, hey, here's some information I provide to all of my patients about abuse and resources and made sure she had the information she needed. And as I often say, she knew that I knew, I knew that she knew that I knew, but um, I was trying to be respectful and yet give her the information she needed. So let's say the patient discloses abuse. I think it's important to begin with an empowerment statement and it may sound cliche, but I mean it all in all sincerity. Hey, what you just shared with me takes a lot of guts and courage. I think it's also important to then validate their experience. Hey, what you're sharing with me is abusive behavior, and this is a name for it. It's called crazy making, or it's called isolation, naming it for what it is, as we've already talked about. 
And although women in these situations are victims, I would like to use the term survivor because it sends the message that they are strong, they have developed some amazing skills to survive this situation. I think it's also vital we be authentic in our response and maybe you're hearing a pretty horrendous story. It's okay to realize we're human and say this, what you just shared with me makes me very sad, but then let's make sure we're still redirecting back to the patient and the client. Again, we've talked about informing them of their risks, making sure they have resources to develop a safety plan, and getting that warm referral to the shelter advocate. And it's vitally important we avoid recreating the dynamics of power and control and make sure the patient has the information they need, but they are making their own decisions in this. And very briefly, as I begin to conclude, the question comes up, are you safe at this time? And even though the patient often says she's safe, we need to make sure again that, she's, um, in, that we're informing them of their risk because they may be in denial of the danger they're in. And recently at an NIH symposium, Jackie Campbell provided some research to document that the question, are you safe at home, does not always work very well. It's not always very effective. So just keep that in mind. It doesn't mean you can't ask that question, but keep in mind that women in these situations often may respond that they're safe. So again, we need to partner with the domestic violence advocates. Here's a link for um, partnering with the providers in your community. Be prepared to make warm referrals. And doulas, it would be fabulous if you're able to offer some volunteer services to the pregnant, pregnant women in the shelters. And I hope that another result of this presentation is that advocates and doulas alike connect and do cross-training about their roles and the work that they do. We all learn from each other and can be stronger as a result. So I want to conclude by making sure we're all informed on doing the harm reduction approach, providing an approach to working with these pregnant women with where they are rather than where we think they should be. And this involves helping people stay safer in an unsafe environment that maybe they're not yet willing or able to leave. And it can be as simple as making sure they know how uh, to access 911, have access with a neighbor, what's their support system looking like, and it may be as concrete as saying, if you're getting beat up by your partner, you are per you're getting in the fetal position and protecting yourself, covering your head, covering your abdomen. So ultimately, the message we need to leave with these women is no matter what, I'm here for you. We want to keep that door open. Um, I want to conclude with what I began with. I hope that after this presentation, um, you see some of these aspects with new eyes, see this issue with new eyes. And I am so excited about the conversations that I anticipate will result from today's presentation, conversations between the advocates, doulas, and all those who are working in this field so that we can all better connect and provide quality care as a result. Um, so thank you so much, and I do um, apologize for going a little bit over, and I would like to open uh, this session uh, now to a question and answer dis and discussion time. Hello. Thanks, Pam. For, okay, great. I wanted to make sure I was off mute. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Um, this was fantastic. And please feel free to post any questions you may have in the public chat, and I'll ask them of Pam now. Um, I know I saw one question earlier that asked about um, if the woman is past childbearing age but may still be having triggers come up for her. And so I wasn't able to see the full context of that question um, because so many things are going through. But um, Pam, maybe you can talk a little bit about if there are any triggers that may come up once the woman has given birth and maybe she has a newborn at home. I don't know if you've seen any instances of um, there being concerns after that time. Absolutely. Um, I think, again, even getting back to postpartum depression, I think um, the women in these situations, I mean, think about how life-changing and um, having a baby is. And although it is absolutely wonderful, it can be extremely stressful. It can be very anxiety-provoking. Then you layer on um, that she has been in this abusive situation, is probably still dealing with her 
own angst uh, as a result of this abuse. So triggers may come up from, from maybe a more intense postpartum depression. Um, the, she's getting even possibly more sleep de deprived from a waking baby, uh, needing feedings through the night, possibly by touch. Um, and that's why I wanted to bring up just the contact with this new baby. Um, how comfortable is she with, with touch and how important touch is in, in the development of our newborns? Um, so feeding the baby may bring up um, uh, some triggers. Um, the baby's cries may bring up triggers as well. So I think it's an extremely vulnerable time. Um, she may also be dealing with um, just physical recovery, um, soreness in the vaginal area, um, uterine cramping, um, breast leaking milk, um, and it all can be triggers, whether it's physical or emotional. Um, so I think it's uh, multifactorial and uh, important that we don't just stop our work once this baby is born. It's also a very vulnerable time during this postpartum period as she makes this adjustment. Great. Um, another question that came up was um, previous material written by Penny Simpson, um, which I think everyone knows is one of the pioneers in this uh, field of work. Um, it stated that we should not ask uh, pregnant women that we're working with about their experience with victimization. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I think basically the question was that typically we, um, as doulas, are instructed to wait for disclosure. What are your thoughts on that? Well, that's a great question. Um, my approach has always been to be proactive and my experience as a midwife is if I can get to some underlying issues that may end up playing a role and, and potentially have a negative impact on a patient's experience, I want to get them out now. And, and I, I think maybe what Penny's referring to is we certainly don't want to force this question, but I think it's a great question to ask and help the patient um, identify if she's ever been in a situation like that so then we can move forward with tools for her, coaching her on coping mechanisms, how to best communicate with a prenatal care provider or with the house, hospital staff and um, be more prepared in that situation. So yes, I think it's a delicate issue. I think we need to be careful, again, not to overwhelm our, our, our pregnant patients. We certainly may not want to start with that type of question, but once trust and rapport has been established and they know that we're there for them, I think it still is a very important question um, to ask and to explore. Great, thank you. Um, scrolling back up, there was another question I wanted to ask. Oh, so two more questions that I see. So one is, um, oh, and I'm sorry, I keep scrolling. One is, how can shelter advocates uh, work to find a doula in their community that they can connect pregnant survivors with? Um, I believe there is a link um, to the doulas, and Kenya, you can maybe help me with that. But I tell you what, once you have the link and you find a doula or you know that there are doulas in your community, you know, I often say it's as simple as a phone call, and we all need to connect and make that phone call. And what I would suggest, and this has helped me in my career in trying to connect with local resources, is set up time to meet. Even if it's 15 to 30 minutes, we all have busy schedules, but 15 to 30 minutes um, to meet over coffee and discuss how we can each help each other and what approach um, we can take, what our availability is. Um, so I think the advocates, um, I appreciate this question so much because that's the purpose of this presentation. Um, find the local doulas. There's probably a, a list and a link uh, that we can offer to you. Um, and then make those phone calls and have a list of maybe more than one doula so that coverage is there and the services that they can provide can help whatever pregnant women are in your shelter. Um, but it's all also about us meeting together, and that way we know each other, we know what each other um, does in our work, and we can better plan for these pregnant women together. 
Great. Thanks so much, Pam. Um, and as everyone can see, I've put up the slides with some resources on where to find advocacy, um, both the National Domestic Violence Hotline, the Rape, Abuse, Incest National Network, commonly known as RAIN. Um, and then I've also included a few uh, websites for, to find doulas in your community. Um, and this, all of the PowerPoint materials as well as the link to the technical assistance guidance will be sent out in an email following this webinar. Um, and I will include them as individual links so that if anyone was having problems downloading them from the webinar service, you'll be able to access them outside of the webinar service and hopefully that will resolve the issues. Um, I think Fern wants to share some comments as well. Fern is the co-author of the technical assistance guidance on this topic, so I think she's going to chime in right now. Hi, everyone. Um, Pam, thanks. You did a great job delivering that information. Um, it sounds Thank like you. the response has been really good. I, I just wanted to reinforce to everyone something that Pam had said more in the beginning of the webinar about sort of that universal screening and communication with the people that you're working with. And, that it's really important um, not to self-select who you think might be um, in an unhealthy relationship, but you know there might be folks that you're working with that you know might surprise you. So just kind of keeping that in the back of your head about you know when interacting with people, whether you're using tools such as the ones that Futures Without Violence offers, such as the Reproductive Health Pregnancy Wheel, or the Did You Know Your Relationship Affects Your Health Safety Card, or if you're conducting a more conversational screening, um, you know, based on, um, you know, what the person that you're working with is telling you or what you're picking up on. So I, I just really wanted to, you know, reinforce that that piece of it, and um, also go back to, you know, saying talking about a little bit of data that dating violence numbers are pretty high among adolescents, especially um, when you're seeing, you know, rapid repeat pregnancy, that, that would be a little bit of an indicator too, so to, to pay special attention. So I just wanted um, to... Fern? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Fern, and I, I want to tag on to that on, on two things. There was a statistic long ago that came out. I do talks on dating violence and abuse for high school kids. And one of the statistics is uh, for more physically violent relationships, every nine seconds a teen girl is battered by a partner. And we're not talking about childhood abuse, we're talking about intimate partner abuse. So it is everywhere and um, we need to be doing a better job with our teens and talking about healthy and unhealthy relationships. But um, that's, for, <laughs> that's my quick soapbox on that. Um, but also, I thank you so much for bringing up the idea of universal screening. I screen all my patients, and I learned long ago that I cannot look at somebody based on how they look, who they are, what they say, and know if they're in an abusive situation or not or, or suspect that they are. I learned this lesson long ago by having a woman who came into my office. It was a busy day. I was behind on my schedule. She um, had the classic look um, of a successful woman, confident, all those strong qualities. I almost did not ask her that day in, a, in an attempt to keep up with my schedule, but I decided, no, I need to ask her like I ask all my other patients about this issue. Come to find out she was dealing with a very, very abusive situation with her uh, partner. So I learned long ago, and I appreciate you bringing this up, I routinely screen all my patients, no matter who they are, what they look like, what background they're from. And I encourage um, that uh, the doulas, if you can develop some language, and I'm happy to help with that down the road too, um, that you routinely just ask about this issue. But again, you need to ask in private, of course, when the partner is not around. Um, and that may be another discussion we can have of how best to routine, routinely ask these questions. Great, thanks so much. Um, and I know Casey has a tweet to share, but there's one other question um, I want us to get to right after that. Okay, yes. Um, hi, Pam. This is Casey Keene at the NRC. We've been live tweeting uh, this webinar. Right. It's been wonderful. And we shared a tweet about um, the experiences of pregnancy and birth as being trauma triggers for survivors of sexual abuse. 
And we mm -hmm. got a response to um, that tweet uh, from a survivor who says, if I ever get pregnant, this could happen to me, great. It feels like I'll never escape these memories. And mm. so um, I kind of feel like she's speaking for a lot of survivors of sexual mm -hmm. assault who may fear the experiences of pregnancy um, and childbirth. And I, I wonder if you have any words to share um, with those yeah. survivors. Well, and thank you first for sharing that. And it, it touches my heart deeply. Um, as a midwife, I, first of all, I often say to my patients, Again, in the most gentle way I can, we can't change our histories, but how can we help everyone who are in these situations to move forward in a positive way? Um, and I don't want anyone to take from my discussion that this is an automatic reaction, that they will automatically have a flashback or dissociation. Dissociation, um, fortunately, is, is pretty rare. Um, the case that I described is a very dramatic case. It, it definitely happened, um, and I was trying to make a point. But I do want to also caution that it does not automatically happen. These triggers don't automatically happen. But I think it's also very important um, that we're aware that they can happen and be proactive about it as best we can. Um, but my heart goes out to the person who made that comment, and I certainly um, want to make sure that in a future pregnancy you're able to work with your provider, really be upfront about this so that people are aware. But again, we never want to assume this is going to happen either. Um, but it's, again, back to the awareness and, uh, and understanding what can happen. You know, I think it's also a very disheartening situation that we are not aware this situation happens maybe during labor or birth, and then people don't know how to best handle it. So that's my intention in talking about that as well. Can so I thank also, you. May yeah. I respond to... Oh, this? go ahead, Fern. You know, I want to say to the person that tweeted that a comment that, you know, that's really an inspiration for this type of collaboration and for anyone else and that person who is feeling that way. Um, getting good support is really important and that an empowered birth with that kind of good support can be a really healing experience. So please don't be discouraged. Yeah, fabulous, absolutely. Um, and thank you for that, Fern. And one other question that we had, and this has been a question that came up a few different ways, but uh, basically, the listeners wanted some additional guidance around how to approach this topic with the healthcare provider if the pregnant woman does not want to disclose her victimization to the healthcare provider. So, trying to figure out how to bridge that gap to help the woman still still feel like she has some power and some choices, um, even if she does not want to specifically let her healthcare provider know what her victimization was. Well, I think we, we have to be very careful, um, and as much as we, uh, you know, I'm putting myself in the position of the doula, as much as you may want to disclose because you believe it will be helpful to that woman, um, it's her decision. And I think that's sometimes very challenging, um, but it's, you know, it's also a privacy issue. It's a HIPAA issue. And um, I think we need to be very careful that we're not disclosing information that, that the woman says no. Um, now, can we find ways to be supportive of that woman if she does not want to disclose? Absolutely. And that's what I would have you, how I would have you try to approach it. What are ways that we can just continue to support this woman um, uh, without disclosing that specific piece of her, her, in, her background? That's her experience, her information, and again, we need to be respectful of that. Great, thank you. Um, that is a perfect answer, and I absolutely agree that our role is to empower and support, educate, and advocate for pregnant women. 